book, The Stonewall Riots, A Documentary History. And um, I'm gonna introduce you, Mark, and I'm gonna read a little bit about what he does. Okay, so Mark Stein is an award-winning historian who has authored four critically acclaimed scholarly books and edited a three-volume encyclopedia on LGBT history. Mark's first monograph, City of Sisterly and Brotherly Loves, Lesbian and Gay Philadelphia, 1945-1972, was the first book-length study of gay and lesbian history in a major US, US city. He then served as the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of LGBT History in America, which won four major awards for reference works. In the last decade, he has published, yeah, congratulations. I know, but that was like, I'm sharing. I'm not sharing my experience. Okay, so in the last decade, he has published three books, Sexual Injustice, Supreme Court Decisions from Grace Wolf to Roe, uh, Rethinking the Gay and Lesbian Movement, and The Stonewall Riots, a Documentary History. Mark is also a former coordinating editor of the Boston-based Gay Community News and a former coordinator of the Sexuality Studies Program at New York University in Toronto. He is currently the vice chair of the board of directors of the LGBT Historical Society, an advisory board member of the Wilcox Archives at the LGBT Community Center in Philadelphia, and a contributing editor for the New York-based Our History website. Mark has taught at the University of Pennsylvania, Raymore, Colby, and York, since 2014, he has been the Jamie and Phyllis Pasker Professor of History at the San Francisco State, at San Francisco State uh, University, where he teaches constitutional law and coordinates the university's annual Rights and Wrongs Constitution Day Conference. So please help me in welcoming Mark with a round of applause. Thank you very much to Nolini and to Demetrius for uh, helping organize and publicize this event. Um, and getting the tech working, even if it's a few minutes late. Uh, I really want to thank you all for turning out. Um, and uh, um, I want to begin before the formal presentation just by really thanking the GLBT Historical Society. Uh, I began using the archives of this organization back in the early 1990s when I was a graduate student studying in Philadelphia uh, and had to come here at Los Angeles to work on Philadelphia queer history because mm -hmm. lots of Philadelphia queer activists had actually been chased out of town um, and ended up on the West Coast. So many of their papers and materials ended up um, on the West Coast. And I have to single out my old friend, college friend, uh, Stacy, who used to put me up in Pacific Heights um, <laughs> while I was doing archival work. Uh, and uh, her son next to her was a baby of one or two. Um, and I made some of those early archival, uh, archival visits. Anyway, I've been coming back to use the archive for years. Um, and then five years ago, I uh, started a new position uh, at San Francisco State. So I got to get more directly and actively involved. And for the last three years and a bit, I've been on the um, board of directors. So it's been a great way to engage more with the organization. So I really encourage you, if you haven't previously, to check out the archives downtown, become a member, come to the exhibits. It's really a great uh, and unique uh, organization. Um, um, and I've been to lots of queer archives um, in the United States. And this is really a unique organization with both the archives and the public fronting uh, museum as well. Uh, so yes, so today um, is, I guess it's kind of my West Coast launch since I had an, an event in Philadelphia a week or two ago for uh, this new book of mine, um, which I worked on for about a couple of years. And if it's not clear already, it's a, um, it's a documentary reader. So it puts together 200 documents from 1965 to 1973 with two central chapters that focus on Stonewall itself, the inn and the riots, and then surrounding chapters, three from the pre-Stonewall era and three from the post-Stonewall era, that uh, look at uh, developments leading up to Stonewall and then developments uh, following Stonewall. Um, so with that then as a brief introduction, I'm going to continue to work. Yes, so far so good, we'll um, dive in. Um, and uh, yeah, at least that kind of presentation with lots of visuals on about the tech finding. All right, so the Stonewall Riots of 69, when thousands of people protested in the streets in response to a police raid on a Greenwich Village gay bar, have long been identified as the most important event in US LGBT and queer history. Whether they're understood as the starting point or turning point in the history of queer activism, the riots are justifiably viewed as a key moment in the mobilization of one of the most transformative movements of the 20th and 21st centuries. 
They've also become an iconic symbol of resistance to oppression and an inspirational example of empowerment for the dispossessed. Each year, millions of people around the world participate in pride parades that commemorate the rebellion on or near its anniversary. In a distinctly memorable invocation that links the uprising to other aspirational struggles for social justice, U.S. President Barack Obama, at least I have to say that you can say those words right now, U.S. President Barack Obama <laughs> declared in his 2013 inaugural address, we the people declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall. Well, despite the widely recognized significance of the riots, most people know little or nothing about what happened at Stonewall, nor do they know much about the earlier developments that contributed to the eruption of protests that summer, the changes experienced by the movement in the months that followed, and the ways in which the rebellion influenced the city, country, and world. In high school and college classrooms, many teachers now address the uprising, but they do so without a substantial collection of primary sources that can encourage students to explore the riots for themselves. So this is what I set out to provide uh, in my new book. So what exactly happened during the Stonewall riots? Uh, this is an impossible question to answer. We can never recreate the past. And even if we could travel back in time and transport ourselves to Stonewall, so imagine that for a moment, our experiences and accounts would likely differ based on our cultural identities, including our age, class, gender, race, religion, and sexual orientation, and our social roles as police officers, bar owners, club managers, bartenders, bouncers, patrons, neighbors, tourists, or passers-by. If you're like me, you probably most often imagine yourself as a patron, but there were all those other people on the scene as well. Um, our experiences and accounts would also be influenced by our abilities and disabilities related, for example, to health, mobility, language, sight, and hearing our consumption of food, water, alcohol, and drugs, and countless other factors. And none of this means that we can't analyze the riots, but it suggests that we should have a little humility about making definitive pronouncements about what happened. We also should try to remember that every account of the rebellion, whether produced at the time or later, is just that, an account. A single person's narrative cannot provide us with the authoritative truth of what happened. But if we put together a collection of primary sources, assess their plausibility and credibility, <coughs> consider their standpoints and perspectives, and evaluate their value and meaning, we can develop compelling interpretations. So here's my, first, uh, here's my best effort. The Stonewall Inn, located at 51 to 53 Christopher Street, and I'm very proud of myself for figuring out, this is my new tech advance of the week, how to do that with Blue Arrow, um, uh, on Christopher Street, occupied two adjacent buildings constructed in the 1840s. In 1934, the inn, which had been operating as a speakeasy at a nearby location, moved into the first floor, where it functioned as a bar and restaurant. In 1965, real estate investor Joel Weiser purchased the buildings. The original Stonewall closed shortly thereafter, following a fire that damaged the business, but in 1966, four men with organized crime affiliations, at least one of whom was gay, decided to open a gay bar at the site. And one of the things I find interesting about the map on the left, it's actually the original map of the Greenwich Village Historic District, which was designated and recognized just months before the Stonewall riots. Wow. So this, um, when this new Stonewall opened in 1967, it did so as a bottle club. Officially, bottle clubs admitted only members and their guests. Members were expected to bring their own bottles of alcohol, which would be served by waiters. In reality, this was a mechanism commonly used by organized crime to circumvent liquor laws. On most nights, the Stonewall's doorman admitted most people who wanted to enter as long as they were perceived to be gay, trans, gender, queer, and or interested in same-sex sex. Admission was a dollar on weekdays and three dollars on weekends. Some patrons complained about high prices, watered-down drinks, dirty glasses, and unclean facilities. It was that kind of bar. Um, but the bar's relatively large size, eclectic mix of patrons, and reputation for dancing, drugs, camping, cruising, and go-go boys made it a popular destination. Many accounts suggest that the patrons were diverse in terms of class and race. Most were probably white, 
A significant number were African American and Puerto Rican. Most were middle or working class, some poor and or homeless. The majority probably identified as men, a smaller number as women. Many saw themselves as gay, bi, or homosexual. A small minority viewed themselves as lesbian. Others may have enjoyed same-sex sex without claiming a distinct sexual identity. Uh, um, and some identified as straight. There was a significant and visible presence of gender queer people, some of whom identified as butches, drags, queens, transsexuals, or transvestites. Some were hustlers or prostitutes. Most were in their teens, 20s, or 30s. So the pitiful raid on the Stonewall, the second in one week, began in the early morning hours of Saturday, June 28. Some accounts suggest that the police targeted the bar because it was unlicensed, unsanitary, and suspected of violating liquor laws. Others claim that the main cause was a breakdown in the system whereby the owners paid off the police to minimize raids and closures. Still others point to official or unofficial investigations into police corruption, male prostitution, and blackmailing rings that targeted men who had sex with men. There was also the upcoming mayoral election. Many public officials believed that anti-vice crackdowns were politically advantageous because they made them appear morally virtuous and tough on crime. While well, armed with a warrant authorizing them to search the Stonewall for evidence of illegal alcohol sales, the police began their operation. Shortly after midnight, four undercover police officers, two men, two women, and an inspector from the city's Department of Consumer Affairs entered the bar to observe the scene and gather evidence. A short while later, the two undercover policemen exited the bar and met up with four officers waiting nearby. At approximately 1.20 a.m., five of the six policemen outside the bar entered the building, announced their presence, and demanded to see identification cards. Several sources indicate that there were approximately 200 people in the bar when the, when the raid began. <coughs> the police <coughs> detained several bar employees, patrons without identification, butches, transvestites, to use the term of the day, and people who talked back or fought back. They told everyone else to leave. As the latter exited the bar, they joined others to form an angry and agitated crowd on the nearby streets and sidewalks. Uh, when the police emerged from the bar with several patrons and employees in their custody, the multiracial crowd began to erupt. And this is really on the left, one of our only images of that confrontation that began to develop. It's actually quite rare. Um, the image on the right, uh, which is a similar image used on the cover of my book, was actually a staged photo uh, on, the second, on the second day. Um, but as for the first night still, according to some accounts, a butch lesbian, possibly Stormy Delarbery, uh, De was the first to fight back. Multiple accounts emphasize the distinctively aggressive defiance of trans people, street youth, and people of color, including Delarbery, Marsha P. Johnson, and Sylvia Rivera. Mm -hmm. Soon the crowd, which included straight allies, was shouting at the police and throwing coins at the building. Uh, as the police, now joined by other officers from their precincts, attacked the protesters and the protesters fought back, several prisoners were liberated or liberated themselves from the police wagon. The officer in charge then ordered the wagon to leave with those who had been taken into custody, which it did. But the crowd forced the remaining police to retreat into the bar. The crowd subsequently shattered some of the Stonewall's windows, attacked the building with bricks, stones, uh, coins, um, sorry, bricks, stones, cans, and bottles, tried to break down the front door with an uprooted parking meter, and attempted to light the bar on fire. Eventually, police reinforcements arrived, and members of the tactical patrol force Specialists in riot control tried to clear the streets. Over the next several hours, thousands of people rioted in the streets with campy courage and fierce fury. Thousands rioted again on Saturday night and Sunday morning. The situation calmed down on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday nights, but a third night of major protests took place on Wednesday. Okay, so this is just a broad overview. After all, the point of my book, the whole point of my book is to encourage readers to develop their own interpretations. Overall, the preponderance of the evidence indicates that approximately 13 people were arrested on the first night, three or four on the second, and five on the third. Many more were, det were detained. Several police officers and a larger number of protesters were injured, many battered and bloodied by police violence. As for the Stonewall Inn, 
Uh, the exterior of the building and the interior contents suffered extensive damage. The bar closed in October 69. By this time, the riots had inspired the formation of the Gay Liberation Front and Queens Liberation Front in New York, the transformation of the LGBT movement, and the mobilization of thousands of new activists. Over the next several decades, as the rebellion was commemorated in pride parades in and beyond New York, the building where the uprising began was used for various commercial purposes. In 2016, President Obama designated the Stonewall National Monument at the site of the riots. Well, over the last several decades, when historians have tried to address the question of why the Stonewall riots occurred, when and where they did, they've come up with several answers. Few give much credence to the popular myth that the rebellion was completely spontaneous and entirely unprecedented. With varying degrees of enthusiasm, most historians rely on three explanations. First, there's the notion that the uprising was the culmination of homophile movement organizing, which had begun in the early 50s and radicalized in the mid-60s. And a good example of that kind of work, John D'Amelio's classic work, Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities. Second, there's the idea that the riots were influenced by a long tradition of bar-based resistance and the distinct factors that shape that tradition in New York. You know, and some of our most foundational works on bar resistance are George Chauncey's Gay New York, um, Liz Kennedy and Madeline Davis's Boots of Leather, and Esther Newton's book on Cherry Grove. Third, there's the concept that the rebellion was influenced by the radicalization of other movements in the late 60s and the wave of urban riots that began with the African-American Watts Rebellion in Los Angeles in 1965. But in my new book, I offer a fourth possible interpretation, which actually revives a theory first put forward by reporter Don Jackson in his October 1969 report on the riots in the Los Angeles Advocate, uh, the monthly gay newspaper. So according to Jackson, and I'm quoting him here, experts in group behavior say that tensions in a minority group become most acute at times when the minority group members see their status suddenly take a turn for the worse after a long period of improvement. This exactly describes the situation in New York preceding the riots. That's the end of the quote. Now as far as I can determine, the expert referenced by Jackson was political scientist James Davies, whose influential 1963 essay toward a theory of revolution had argued that revolutions are most likely to occur not when conditions are at their worst and not when conditions are improving at an insufficient pace, um, but rather when, and I'm quoting him here, a prolonged period of objective economic and social development is followed by a short period of sharp reversal. In 1969, shortly before Stonewall, Davies, the political scientist, had tried to apply his J-curve theory to the series of urban riots that had begun with Watts. His conclusion was that, quote, revolution is most likely to take place when a prolonged period of rising expectations and rising gratifications is followed by a short period of sharp reversal during which the gap between expectations and gratifications quickly widens and becomes intolerable. So in The Advocate, uh, Don Jackson, the gay journalist, didn't explain why he thought the J-curve theory helped explain the Stonewall riots. He just said it fits the situation perfectly in New York. Uh, so in my book's introduction, I try to fill in the gaps, focusing in particular on the gains made by the LGBT movement in the 1960s, and then the losses experienced in the first six months of 1969. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot more about that, but I'm happy to, to, uh, to answer any questions you might have um, about that part of the my introduction. So in the rest of my book, I present 200 documents from 65 to 73 that illuminate developments before, during, and after the LGBT movement's most important turning point. The, three, uh, the first three chapters, which address bars and policing, agendas and visions, and political protests before the riots, provide ample evidence for supporters of the four explanations I've just highlighted. They also challenge simplistic portrayals of the pre-Stonewall era as continuously dark, dreary, and devastating, and reductive depictions of the pre-Stonewall homophile movement as consistently small, accommodationist, and ineffective. The next two chapters, which focus on the Stonewall Inn and the Stonewall Riots, present an array <coughs> of complementary and competing accounts of the bar and the rebellion. These range from descriptions of the Stonewall in pre-riots, books, and guides, to accounts of the uprising in mainstream, alternative, and LGBT media. 
The final three chapters present documentary accounts of post-Stonewall agendas and visions, political protests, and pride marches and parades, all of which provide readers with resources for thinking about the early impacts, influences, and interpretations of the riots. So this is supposed to be a talk on California, so you've been probably wondering when I'm going to get to California. Well, now I'm going to get to California. So in the rest of my talk today, I'll turn to California in the Stonewall era, focusing on how news about the riots reached the West Coast, right? This was the era before the internet and instant news. Um, how Californians might have viewed the uprising in relation to pre-Stonewall developments, and how Golden State residents responded to the news from New York. Given the importance we now attribute to Stonewall, it may surprise you to learn that the rebellion received minimal attention by the mainstream media or the African-American press in the summer of 1969. In June and July, there were short reports in the New York Times, Post, and Daily News, none of which treated the riots as front page news. Alternative New York periodicals, including The Village Voice, East Village Other, Rat, National Guardian, and Screw, provided more substantial coverage, but The Voice's reports were strongly criticized as anti-gay. In fact, one of the Gay Liberation Front's first major demonstrations targeted The Voice in September 69. So in a sense, a little warning, the documents I, rep I reprint, of course, should not be taken at face value. They're meant to be assessed, critiqued, uh, and interpreted. Um, neither the San Francisco Chronicle nor the Los Angeles uh, Times covered the riots. Uh, and national magazines um, uh, didn't refer to the rebellion until October articles in Time and Newsweek, and a December one in Esquire that was immediately attacked by gay readers as genocidal in its the absence of coverage in the Chronicle, I think, is particularly noteworthy because, coincidentally enough, um, the newspaper published a three-part series on lesbians on June 30th, July 1st, and July 2nd, while the riots were still going on. And the last of these pieces focused on San Francisco's radical new Committee for Homosexual Freedom, which had formed several months before Stonewall. So undoubtedly, though, that series was prepared before the riots occurred, but it's interesting to me that there was no revision made, especially to the third, where the story of the riots would have fit, fit very well fit into um, the account they provided of the new radicalization of the movement in San Francisco. So what about the LGBT press? The Stonewall riots had occurred at a transitional moment in the history of queer media. Of the three uh, homophile movement magazines with national reach in the 50s and early 60s, one, Matching Review, and the latter, all based in California. Only the latter, and I have that actually spelled with the T's, but I know it sounds like the, the D's, um, which focused on lesbians, was still publishing in 1969. So Matching Review and one had long since stopped publishing by the late 60s. Since 1964, and this was a contribution of my first book, Philadelphia's Drum Magazine, which had much more sexually radical politics and more sexually explicit photographs, had been the mo movement's most widely circulating periodical. But its publisher was an early victim of the Nixon administration's crackdown on obscenity, and Drum ceased publication just weeks before the Stonewall uprising. So, you know, I think for me, an interesting counterfactual uh, question would be how would Drum have covered the Stonewall riots? Well, we don't have the advantage of that that coverage, right, because um, uh, of the anti-censorship actions of the Nixon administration. Some of the most in-depth coverage of the riots appeared in the Madison Society of New York's newsletter, and there were also reports in homophile periodicals in Chicago, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. Interestingly, Madison New York's newsletter did more than any other publication to highlight the prominent role played by trans people in the riots. While two of the most significant trans periodicals of 1969, the Erickson Educational Foundation Newsletter and Transvestia, did not cover Stonewall. <laughs> so in California, um, there were short reports in several LA gay periodicals, including Magpie and Tangents. I think I just have Tangents up here. Two longer pieces in The Advocate, and you see the headline on the top left and brief items in three San Francisco publications, the latter published by the Daughters of Elitis, Vector published by the Society for Individual Rights, and the Committee for Homosexual Freedom newsletter. The earliest, most original, and most extensive coverage of Stonewall in California came not from the LGBT press, but from Berkeley Bar and Berkeley Tribe. Alternative 
uh, papers that published the work of radical gay and bisexual writers. The first item in Berkeley Bard was Gays Hit New York Cops by Leo Lawrence, who began by declaring, homosexuals took to the streets in New York City last weekend and joined the revolution. Lawrence's choice of words, join the revolution, was no accident. From his perspective, the gay revolution had begun several months earlier in California. And this notion was reinforced by an eyewitness to the riots who reportedly told Lawrence that, quote, the gay community in New York City has been inspired by your homosexual liberation stories in the bar. Well, Lawrence's report on Stonewall, which credited his own writing for inspiring the rebellion, <laughs> was certainly self-serving. Um, but there's much to be learned, I think, by following his lead and looking at the history of California's pre-Stonewall LGBT demonstrations. Doing so can help us demolish the myth that queer people didn't fight back before the riots. It can help us appreciate the diversity of the LGBT movement before Stonewall, and it can provide a foundation for thinking about what was so revolutionary about the uprising and how the pre and post Stonewall movements differed. <coughs> and my focus here is going to be on public demonstrations rather than other forms of resistance because I think it's useful to place Stonewall within a tradition of LGBT direct action and also because marches, picket lines, and sit-ins are distinctly dramatic events that play unique and powerful roles in movements for social change. So I won't be talking about court-based litigation, which is certainly of interest to me. A lot of my work's based on that. There are other forms of resistance, but rather I'm going to focus on public demonstrations. So LGBT protests and demonstrations certainly occurred before 65, and it's likely that we will continue to discover new ones. But my book begins in 65, in part because that year witnessed a national upsurge in LGBT direct action. Now some claim that this began with a major San Francisco police raid on the Council on Religion and the Homosexuals New Year's Ball at California Hall. But while LGBT activists and allies certainly fought back in the media and in court after the raid, I haven't seen evidence suggesting that they responded to this provocation with a demonstration. So instead, I'll begin uh, in September 1965, when 30 activists, most of whom were affiliated with the Daughters of Elitists, Madison Society, Society for Individual Rights, and Council on Religion and the Homosexual, picketed San Francisco's recently consecrated Grace Cathedral during Sunday morning services to protest the Episcopal Diocese's punitive actions against Canon Robert Cromie, an outspoken supporter of gay rights. California's next day demonstration took place in May 1966, Armed Forces Day, when activists in LA, San Francisco, and Berkeley, including a significant number of veterans, participated in nationally coordinated protests against anti-homosexual discrimination by the military. Now the timing of this is interesting, as popular opinion was shifting around this time to oppose US participation in the Vietnam War. One of the slogans used in the demonstration nevertheless declared, the draft dodges homosexuals. Homosexuals don't dodge the draft. So in other words, very patriotic kind of message. In Los Angeles, a 13-car motorcade with large gay rights signs traveled through several city neighborhoods. In San Francisco, 500 people witnessed 50 activists demonstrating in front of the federal building. Pictured here on the left is DOB founder Del Martin. Um, uh, Del, Del Martin. Glide Memorial Church's A. Cecil Williams, an African-American minister and founding member of the Council on Religion and the Homosexual, spoke at the San Francisco rally and referenced the homosexual revolution currently underway. This is 1966. In further evidence of the movement's diversity, one sign at the de demonstration declared in Spanish, todo hombre tiene el derecho de servir a su país. Williams also spoke at a rally outside the Berkeley Sproul Hall, as did Latino activist Al Alvarez. According to one report, 1,500 to 2,000 people attended the Berkeley rally. But I have my suspicions that they were just counting students walking by. <laughs> so two months later, in July 1966, 25 activists affiliated with Vanguard, a new organization based in San Francisco's Tenderloin, picketed Compton's cafeteria to protest harassment and discrimination against what they termed homosexuals, hustlers, and people who today would likely refer to themselves as trans or genderqueer. 
Well, some of you might be more familiar with the August 1966 Compton's Cafeteria Riot. This is what I'm talking about is in July. Um, the riot in August, made famous by Susan Stryker and Victor Silverman's film, Screaming Queens. But the earliest documentary trace we have of the 1966 riot is the San Francisco Pride program of 1972, six years earlier. You know, one of the strengths of that documentary is its reliance on oral histories, but we actually have no documentary evidence for six years that a riot occurred. So this is not to suggest that the riot didn't occur, but it underscores the importance of not relying exclusively on documentary sources when oral histories tell different tales. So Vanguard, this is one of my favorite of the pre Stonewall demonstrations, also was responsible for another protest in the summer of 1966, a street power demonstration in which 50 local youth borrowed brooms from the city and conducted a sweep-in on the streets of the Tenderloin. As their press release declared, um, the drug addicts, pillheads, teenage hustlers, lesbians, and homosexuals who make San Francisco's meat rack their home are tired of living in the midst of the filth thrown out onto the sidewalks and into the streets by nearby businessmen. Right? So obviously reversing the usual. <laughs> so California's um, next LGBT protest took place in September 66 when 30 activists demonstrated at the state fair in Sacramento handing out thousands of leaflets to protest the refusal of fair officials to permit several homophile groups to sponsor an educational booth. Two months later, uh, Vector magazine, published by San Francisco Society for Individual Rights, reported on one of the first movements, the movement's first references to gay power, which obviously was modeled on black power. Um, and if I ever have a chance to write at greater length about this, it pains me to say that the attorney who first used gay power was straight. So, um, and and the, the, the initial uses of gay power actually referred to economic power, right, and the possibility of building up uh, um, uh, gay businesses, which I think is also very interesting. Is that Terrence or Vincent? It's Patrick. 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 Okay. I don't Patrick. actually know. Do you guys know? I, yeah. I, Patrick. Do you see yeah. him? Yeah. Okay. One yeah. of the cells. Yeah. So one of the movement's largest pre stonewall protests took place in February 67, when 400 people demonstrated against LA police brutality outside the Black Cat Bar, which had experienced a violent raid on New Year's Eve. The Black Cat protest, sponsored by the LA Council on Religion and the Homosexual and the group Pride, Personal Rights in Defense and Education, was coordinated with the citywide Right of Assembly and Movement Committee, which included groups representing African Americans, Mexican Americans, and youth. Formed after the Watts Rebellion in 1965, the committee staged six demonstrations in different LA neighborhoods on the same day, all to protest what they called police lawlessness. Nine months later, a much smaller demonstration received less media attention, but it too points to the wave of LGBT political protests that was building in the years before Stonewall. In October 67, Sir Lady Java, an African American trans woman, led a group of 25 Angelinos, including an ACLU representative, in a protest against the Red Fox Club, which had discontinued her employment. Marching in opposition to the LA Police Commission's Rule Number no. 9, which banned cross-gender impersonation, quote unquote, in entertainment, uh, Java declared, the law is depriving me of my livelihood. I feel it's unconstitutional. Uh, Java lost the battle, but won the war when the police abandoned Rule 9 a little more than a year later. At least three LGBT political demonstrations took place in California in 68. In June, the DOB and Society for Individual Rights distributed 2,500 leaflets at the annual convention of the American Medical Association in San Francisco. They were protesting the claims of psychiatrist Charles Socarides, who had presented a paper on curing homosexuals. Two weeks later, on July 3rd, 25 homophile activists returned to the site of the 1966 Armed Forces Day demonstration in the Federal Building in San Francisco. On the day before the July 4th holiday, they highlighted the gaps they perceived between the revolutionary rhetoric of the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the realities of their lives. Further south, on the night of August 17th, after L.A. police arrested two men for lewd conduct at a bar called The Patch, Manager Lee Glaze publicly denounced the police to the crowd of 250, and then followed the arrested men to the police station, where he helped them obtain bail and a lawyer. After returning to the patch, Glaze asked if any of the remaining patrons owned a flower shop. Sure enough, one did. 
Blaise then purchased hundreds of flowers, which he and 25 patrons carried back to the police station so they could monitor the situation. After waiting hours for the men to be released, their flower power, uh, the flower power activists showered um, uh, the men with bouquets as the startled police looked on. Uh, while many LGBT people applauded Blaze, the bar's landlord unfortunately did not, and by December the bar was forced to close. But it's not clear that Leo Lawrence had all of these earlier demonstrations in mind when he praised the Stonewall rioters for joining California's homosexual revolution. More likely, he was referring to more recent developments and the radicalization of gay activism that had begun in San Francisco in the spring of 1969. One of the key precipitating factors in this was the firing of activist Gail Whittington from his job at State's Steamship Company um, after this story and photograph featuring Whittington in front and Lawrence behind him were published in the Berkeley Bar. Around the same time, the Society for Individual Rights removed Lawrence from his new position as vector editor after he began calling for a gay revolution. Whittington and Lawrence then took the lead in creating the Committee for Homosexual Freedom, which in April 1969, so this is two, three months before Stonewall, began staging daily and then weekly demonstrations at states, at state's steamship's offices in the financial district. And I actually, just this year, found this post of flyer that was used for the state steamship's uh, demonstrations, rather phallic if you look at it closely, um, in the GLBT Historical Society's collections. I think, this, I think I found this in the papers of Charles Thorpe. And um, if you can read it, it says 2320 California Street at the bottom, Committee for Homosexual Freedom, which I think they initially spelled with one M. Um, um, and um, um, this was used uh, to promote the, those regular demonstrations. Here we see a few of the protests, the regular protests of state steamship. And for those of you in the room with connections like me to SF State, uh, on the far right, although not the far right politically, that's Charles Thorpe, who was the founder of the first gay group uh, at San Francisco State, and uh, launched then the moment why the reference to California cops murder homosexuals. Um, uh, so where am I? Um, so meanwhile, uh, after the brutal beating and killing of Howard Eflin, by LA police in March, mm -hmm. uh, and the sexual entrapment, shooting, and killing of Frank Bartley by Berkeley police in April. And I have to say, I did my best to commemorate the 50th anniversaries of those two killings, first in LA um, and then in Berkeley just a few weeks ago, but the local mainstream newspapers didn't seem to be interested. Um, but after these two murders, the Society for Individual Rights organized a funeral motorcade that traveled from San Francisco to Berkeley and a demonstration at the Berkeley Hall of Justice. In May, the CHF continued its demonstrations against state steamship, participated in a Safeway rape um, boycott protest in the Mission. I'm um, oh, sorry, I think I'm a little ahead of myself. So this is the demonstration um, uh, at Berkeley, the Berkeley Police Department uh, after the killing of um, Bartley. Um, and then here we get the Safeway protest, um, a great boycott protest in the mission, and then picketed tower records near Fisherman's Wharf after the store fired a bisexual employee based on suspicions that he was gay. In the latter case, the company eventually rehired the worker. More generally, LGBT Californians in April, May, and June provided a preview of post-Stonewall queer activism by confronting police violence, attacking capitalist exploitation, staging multiple direct action protests, and aligning themselves with the revolutionary movement of movements. So what then were the immediate effects of Stonewall on California LGBT activism? At first, they were actually pretty muted. As I noted earlier, um, in July, uh, Berkeley Barb and Berkeley Tribe reported favorably on the riots. California LGBT periodicals followed suit shortly thereafter, but they didn't generally treat Stonewall as a transformative event. They were much more focused on the police killings of Howard Eflind in LA, Frank Bartley in Berkeley, and a third killing that happened right before Stonewall, Philip Kaplan in Oakland. Um, I find his story also really interesting apparently straight man with a young daughter playing at, uh, uh, at Lake Merritt, uh, had a prostate problem, um, went to the bathroom a lot, and police thought he was um, doing whatever in the bathrooms, and beat him up, and he died of a stroke four days later. Right. 
Um, uh, so the local press was much more focused on those police killings, as well as the employment discrimination campaigns against state steamship and tower records. With respect to LGBT direct action in California, July, August, and September don't actually look much different from April, May, and June. In San Francisco, for example, uh, the Committee for Homosexual Freedom continued to demonstrate every week at State Steamship. They also organized protests at the Federal Building and at Funland, a Market Street business accused of mistreating LGBT patrons. But something was obviously going on, presumably in conversations, collaborations, communities, and coalitions, all of which contributed to mobilization and radicalization. And the signs of that, I think, begin to show up in October. In October, um, the CHF and two new Bay Area groups, Gay Guerrilla Theater and Gay Liberation Front, disrupted a meeting of the Society for Individual Rights and challenged the Tavern Guild on the gender politics of its annual drag ball. Now, you know today, a lot of us associate that image on the top right with the Compton's Cafeteria Riots, because it's used in a lot of the publicity and promotional material for that, um, for that uh, film. But it's actually not from the Compton's Cafeteria Riots. There's no you know, photographic images of those. The, the image is actually from the, the, um, his protest uh, against the Tavern, um, the tavern Guild for its, um, its drag ball. In October and November, Bay Area gay liberationists marched in anti-war demonstrations and supported Black Panther protests. Um, on Halloween, a multiracial and mixed-sex group of 50 gay liberationists demonstrated at the San Francisco Examiner to confront the newspaper's hostile coverage of LGBT issues. After purple ink was dumped on the protesters from the Examiner's second floor, the activists fought back by leaving colored imprints of their hands all over the building. The ensuing police violence and arrests of 12 protesters was followed by a spontaneous march to City Hall, a sit-in at the mayor's office, and three additional arrests. And actually, that notion of the purple hand lived on for years in San Francisco. Maybe in some quarters it still does as a kind of symbol of, of gay resistance. And you'll actually see it uh, at the very end of my presentation in the first flyer, uh, in the flyer for the first uh, gay pride uh, events in San Francisco. <coughs> It was purple to them and lavender to us. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So a few weeks later, um, on Thanksgiving, 200 gay liberationists rallied in Union Square and marched to six anti-gay, anti-lesbian, and anti-trans businesses, making a special stop at the downtown offices of Delta and Western Airlines. Delta had recently refused to board an SF State student wearing a Homosexuals for Peace button, and Western had fired six flight attendants believed to be lesbians. I'm smiling because a few of my students are here and we've been looking at some materials about the, the SF State student who wasn't allowed to board uh, the Delta flight. In December, Carl Whitman's Refugees in America, a Gay Manifesto, perhaps the most influential statement of gay liberation's philosophy, was published in the San Francisco Free Press. Whitman called for mobilization, radicalization, and coalition <coughs> building with women and people of color. He attacked capitalism, militarism, sexism, and racism, and he called on everyone to come out and join the gay revolution. It was a distinctly anti-minority um, um, orientation of uh, philosophy, right? He really meant, uh, as did many other radical gay liberations, on the notion that everybody should come out, a universalizing message. More protests followed in the first few months of 1970. In January 200, activists staged a major protest at ABC affiliate KGO after it fired Leo Lawrence. Two GLFers were arrested at the demonstration for chanting, suck cock to beat the draft. <laughs> a few months later, GLF joined forces with a newly established group, Gay Women's Liberation, to interrupt a presentation on electroshock conversion therapy at the annual convention of the American Psychiatric Association held at the Fairmont Hotel. In June, GLF picketed a local Honda dealership that had loaned minibikes to the police for a stepped up campaign against public sex in Golden Gate Park. Meanwhile, across the Bay, gay liberationists also mobilized and radicalized. In October, they participated in UC Berkeley's Student Disorientation Week. In December, Berkeley GLF and Students for Gay Power held a campus kissing. In January, they demonstrated against anti-gay police practices and anti-feminist politics at the university's gym. In March, gay liberationists staged a series of love-ins outside Sproul Hall. And in April, they marched to commemorate the anniversary of the killing of Frank Bartley. Are still not forgotten. Well, LGBT activism also took off in LA in the, first, uh, in the final months of 69. In November, 50 gay liberationists demonstrated at the LA Times. 
Uh, and the newly organized Committee for Homosexual Law Reform began a series of marches and motorcades to advocate for state sex law reform, an effort, by the way, led by Willie Brown. The largest of these marches featured 300 participants. In February 1970, and here the images reflect this, GLF LA launched a series of protests at Barney's Beanery, which eventually persuaded the owner to take down the restaurant's misspelled faggots stay out song. <laughs> Then on Lavender Sunday, which I had certainly never heard about before doing this project, March 1st, GLF LA, led by Pope Morris I, otherwise known as Morris Kite, demonstrated at several area churches, demanding reparations for the long history of Christianity's anti-homosexual hatred. Over the next few months, gay liberationists followed this up with a demonstration against the film Boys in the Band, a memorial march for Howard Eflund, which also challenged the recent police killing of African-American trans sex worker Laverne Turner, a picket line at the Hollywood police station, and a protest against police practices at LA City College. Well, this then takes us to the first anniversary commemorations of the Stonewall Riots, uh, and to my conclusion. So in November 1969, a regional LGBT conference held in Philadelphia decided to discontinue the annual reminder gay rights demonstrations at Independence Hall, which had been held from 1965 to 1969. Instead of marking the nation's birthday in the birthplace of the nation, the movement would now celebrate gay liberation's birthday in its birthplace, though the conference also encouraged activists in other cities to organize their own commemorations of Stonewall. In Los Angeles, liberationists decided to do so. Uh, and in June 1970, Christopher Street West reportedly attracted 1,200 participants and 20,000 spectators, notwithstanding the fact that the police had refused to grant a parade permit until forced to do so by a local judge. San Francisco's commemoration of Stonewall's first anniversary was quite different. According to a preview in the Berkeley Tribe, the week-long schedule of events in the Bay Area would begin with a gay liberation pig roast featuring bacon sandwiches to protest the Honda Hogs. This would take place on Hippie Hill in Golden Gate Park. This would be followed by a Berkeley Gay Liberation Dance at Sherwood Forest, a march from Aquatic Park to the Civic Center in the city, and a gay in at Speedway, Speedway Meadow in Golden Gate Park. The Advocate later reported um, that 20 to 30 people had participated in the march and 200 attended the gay in. But according to the Berkeley Bar, the Honda pigs had raided the gay in and ta uh, taken seven people into custody. And as far as I've been able to determine, San Francisco's first major commemoration of Stonewall didn't take place until 1972. But I have to say, I'm at very early stage of working on that. It's not really included in the book. Um, and uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out the story of those early um, um, pride commemorations in San Francisco. Um, I don't know how well you can see the image. This is the image I referred to earlier, the flyer used for the first um, pride commemoration, Stonewall commemoration in the city. Um, let me see if I can see some of it on my screen, um, which I can't. Um, but you would recognize, if you could see it, a lot of the references to things that I've, refer that I've referred to. So one of the messages on the bottom is signed by the Purple Hand. Um, there's a reference to the Honda Hogs. Um, Stonewall riots in the middle, um, far fucking out. Uh, freaking fag revolution on the bottom left. Uh, gay celebration front on the bottom right. Um, and references here then to many of the, the protests that I've described. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. Have you run across anything about 1971? I used to be part of the Gay Pride Committee back in the late 70s, but there's a fake reverend called Reverend Ray Brochiers, who was a real shit stirrer. Yes. And supposedly he, had, he did the first <coughs> Gay Pride Parade on Polk Street in 1971. Well, the, the, I, I, the book does include documents about San Francisco's commemorations in 72 and 73 because those were large and they, the, the articles I reprinted do cover brochures and the fight he got into. And then this, the 73 one where a few people, sh there were competing events in San Francisco and few people showed up to his event, many more to their competing event. Um, but I haven't seen uh, references to a, to a large one for, um, for 71 in San Francisco. But that's where you know I'm I'm not I'm not on solid ground yet, 
And um, I do know it wasn't one, one of the largest. You know, from the national coverage of prides around the country, it wasn't singled out in any way. I understand there's very little history about it. Yeah, just, yeah. No, that's in reference. And, and yeah, the, several, of, several of us are, are planning on doing more work on that as we start looking to commemorate the first prides. Anyway, I have just right. one more paragraph to finish up, and then, and then we can open up for more uh, conversation and, and discussion. Mm -hmm. um, um, so notwithstanding the limited nature of Stonewall commemorations in the Bay Area in 70 and 71, as far as I know, LGBT direct action protests clearly increased in number, frequency, popularity, and influence in the aftermath of the Stonewall riots. Just as importantly, the politics of the movement changed, with more emphasis on coalitional and intersectional politics, more radical and revolutionary demands, and more gay pride and queer power. Lesbian, bi, trans, and third world, to use the lingo of the day, activists participated in all of this, often playing leading roles in what was generally referred to as gay liberation in 1969 and 70. In the years to come, they would increasingly develop autonomous agendas and visions, while also dreaming of more inclusive LGBT movements and queer worlds. Californians were active in all of this, making meaning out of Stonewall by building on its legacy of engaging in direct action to support radical social change. And with that, I'll conclude. And